Good afternoon. Welcome to Smithsonian Gardens Let's Talk Gardens, a weekly webinar series where we help you turn your brown thumb green. This is a perfect day to watch a webinar if you're in the Mid-Atlantic area. It's rainy, it's gloomy, and I know Janet Draper's presentation is going to cheer you up and add some color to your life. So today, if you could put your questions in the chat box, we'd appreciate it and we will answer all the questions after the presentation. So, without further ado, Janet Draper is a horticulturist with the Smithsonian Gardens, and she's going to give you some hints on choosing plants with design in mind. What a great topic. So Janet, why don't you go ahead and take over and tell us all about these plants that you know are gonna make a big difference in our gardens and our containers. Thank you. I'll disappear. Go ahead and come on on. Okay, awesome. Thanks all for being here. And um, I'm always flattered to be able to share what I've learned over the years. And for those of you who don't know me, I play in the Mary Livingston Ripley Garden. Um, it's a little meandering walkway uh, going from Independence Avenue to the mall proper. And I'm kind of Maybe I don't mean to sound vain, but I'm known for use of color and a lot of vibrant things and a garden that is constantly changing throughout the seasons and throughout the year. And hopefully there's something to look out at every season of the year. And I love to tuck in these little precious gems like this Arisema, a uh, wonderful thing and color in the spring, lots of tulips and, and things like that. Um, the staff for the Ripley Garden is me, myself, and I, uh, especially this year, because my two wonderful volunteers have not been allowed to work downtown, and I miss them tremendously. Um, so what I'm basically saying is there's not a whole lot of staff. And yet the garden seems to change constantly and have interesting things. Um, I am not Wonder Woman. I don't, uh, well, I, it is a full-time job. So I am working a lot, but there are a few plants that I really rely on to be able to showcase and uh, showcase other things. And so today I'm going to share a few of the plants that I rely on and they're not, the, you know, they're not the glamour girls. They're not the divas. These are tough, reliable plants. And by the way, you don't have to scribble like crazy because um, I have a handout for this talk and it will be showing up in the chat box and also you can get it online next week. So don't worry if you don't get all the details. So a few good plants for the sun, a few good um, uh, sun loving shrubs. And again, these are not the newest of the new plants. These are tested proven plants. Bridal wreath spirea. This baby is hardy to zone four, goes down to zone eight or up to zone eight, I should say. But the thing that has happened with bridal wreath spirea, it's not a one and done anymore. The flowers in the spring and then move on. There are new cultivars that have beautiful foliage. My favorite is spirea ogon. Ogon just translates in Japanese to, uh, to yellow, white. What am I thinking? Um, it, it's the yellow leaf spirea. And it on itself is a very um, almost effervescent or filmy plant. You still get the white blooms in early spring, as you see back there in the back. But then as the season progresses, you've got this golden yellow foliage that acts like a foil for all the other divas that start blooming, like the, the peonies here in front. This is the Ito peony uh, Bartzella. But Bartzella only blooms for like two weeks, if we're lucky. 
So I rely on something behind. It's like the backup singers. And here, the Lycoris radiata that comes up in the fall or late summer. Wonderful thing, and they would look really weird without some background plants. Again, the backup singers. And there's their spirea, once again, adding a little bling and a little pizzazz without any, uh, it's, it's not tough. Uh, and again, in the fall, I mean, this is not a one hit wonder plant. It's every season of the year, it looks good. Here it is in the fall, takes on that beautiful apricot orange color before all the foliage drops off. It is a fabulous, fabulous long season plant. It is not going to be something that people come into your garden and go and swoon over this plant. No, it's a tough, durable plant. And by the way, if it gets too big and too rangy, all you do is go in and selectively prune out the biggest woody stems to the ground. And, the, and so you can control the, the size of your plant just by doing that one, one little snip once a year. And I would do that um, after it blooms because blooms are already set now for the spring. So if you would prune it now, you're cutting away flowers. So, okay, Spirea thumbergii ogon is my, uh, my first plant. Second plant is in this picture also, this yucca. And yeah, you're, you're saying yucca, really? Yucca is a, a fabulous plant. Here's, you know, I grew up in Indiana with yucca filamentosa. It is tough, durable thing. It's a Native American, um, native to South Carolina, Florida, Georgia, west of Mississippi. Uh, filamentose refers to these hairs on the side of the, the, uh, the leaves. And when in bloom, it is just magnificent but it's evergreen or ever gray and there are lots of new cultivars out there uh, my colleagues at Hershorn did this fabulous exhibit or display using yucca color guard I mean look at that it it is just a fantastic dramatic statement um, and even during the winter Look at that, with snow on it. It's still bold, it's got presence, it's bringing color and life to the garden. So don't, don't overlook these plants just because you see them around. Um, they can be overused and used badly, but when used in a good way, a, a creative way, they really add a lot to your garden. And look, look at the whole yucca family. Don't just, don't just look at filamentosa. There are other fabulous members of that family that are all evergreen, tough, durable for full sun, dry conditions. They do not like wet feet. So keep them away from your swampy areas. There are enough plants that'll fill those, but for hot, dry areas. So here's, uh, yucca recurvifolia, really, really cool guy. Here it is later in the season, recurvifolia, and yucca rostrata, another fantastic member of the yucca family that's known as the beaked yucca. And here you see another one that is getting pretty good size. It's um, People are always astounded that those are perfectly hardy for me in Washington, D.C. Um, my friends up in Philadelphia are growing them. Uh, you want to plant it in the spring if you're worried about marginal hardiness. Get it in the spring and get it established before going into winter. And maybe that first winter protected a little bit, but after that, uh, good to go. And I, I've got to kind of kind of a little crush on these things. I just think they're awesome. And I have them 
of, I think I have five or six in, in the Ripley. And the Ripley garden is not that big. It's only a third of an acre. So for me to give five or six plants of this size space, mm, uh, yeah, I'm kind of enamored. Uh, another, moving on to the next plant for, for sun, I think, hold on. No, nope, we've got more pictures of the yucca. See, I told you I'm infatuated with it. Uh, look at this. If you didn't have the yucca there, um, the rest of the picture would hold up fairly well, but it might look really busy. And the yucca just gives some depth and some strength. So yeah, yucca rostrata, and they are hard to find. Um, I planted these as one gallon containers uh, in 2005 or seven, somewhere in there. So um, they have grown in place and they're just, ah, I love them. So, and in the winter, they're magical also. So again, a plant that gives you 12 months of interest that seems to change with the light level and things like that. A wonderful thing. Next plant for a sunny condition is another American native, Physocarpus. Um, 10 years ago, you probably would have never heard of Physocarpus. It's uh, nine bark wood, uh, uh, let's see, it's, I have to check my notes here. It's uh, native from Quebec all the way down to Tennessee. I mean, that is a large, large range. Uh, and what the, the hybridizers have done is shrunk it down because normally this member of the Rose family would be eight to 10 feet tall, a big gangly thing. But hybridizers have shrunk it down. And they've also played with the foliage to bring in coloration of the foliage. The first one to come out on the market was this Diablo in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, Diablo, really good plant. Um, it, mine is probably six to seven feet tall by equal width. So it's still, it's still a good size shrub but they're the newer ones on the market, like Tiny Wine and, oh my God, that darts gold. You get not only the form of the plant, but you get the color and the texture of the foliage. Look, look into the Physocarpus uh, plant family because they're really awesome plants and maintenance is just like with the, the Spirea. Uh, if it gets too big, just go in and take out the biggest stems in the spring or after it blooms, uh, take out the, the biggest stems to the ground um, and you can control the size that way or dig out like I think my Diablo needs to go pretty soon. It's it's big and there are a lot of new cultivars that are more um, small garden friendly. So check them out they look good all the time uh they are winter dormant so no foliage in the winter but you still have the structure of the stems so moving on to the shade you know i want to be sure to to show both sun and shade this guy edgeworthia chrysantha oh what a joy what a joy this is the paper plant it's uh, native to china the himalayan regions where they actually make paper out of the pits of the stems um i love it just all year round it is um wider than it is tall um like i'm becoming um it's uh about seven feet tall by seven feet eight feet wide so more of a dome a mounding dome but it's worth the space during the summer you've got these glaucous blue gray leaves that are just they're beautiful i have never noticed any pest diseases uh foliar blemishes nothing and you notice those floral buds already set there. 
and here it is in the winter totally deciduous but the flower buds are hanging there and the snow catches on those beautiful bare stems just showing the silhouette and the skeleton of this plant um, which i mean that is a work of art right there but those little flower buds they remind me of like the flower has its own little woolly jacket on. It's a fuzzy, fuzzy on the outside, like trying to keep the, the flower warm. And then when you look up into the flower, it's golden yellow. And because this is blooming in February or March, somewhere in there in the winter for us, there aren't a whole lot of pollinators out. So what the plant needs to do is send out its fragrance far and wide to, to attract those insects in. Well, it also attracts people in because the fragrance is beautiful. I gotta figure out a way to bottle it because oh, L'Oreal or all those fragrance um, companies would love this fragrance. There, there's a close up of the flower looking up into them and you see the little hairs even on the edge of the flowers. I mean, these are flowers that are built for cold winters. Um, let's see, uh, it's only, what, what amazes me about it, it's only hardy to zone seven through nine. Um, and there is a red form, this is Acabono. Oh, talk about lust worthy. Um, Acabono is not as vigorous nor as hardy as the yellow rice paper plant. So, you know, if you want to coddle it a little bit more or you live south of DC, uh, you could get away with Acabono if you can find it. It's hard to propagate. Um, so there it is. Wonderful plant family. Here it is. Those flowers last for weeks because they're not dealing with the stress and the heat of the summer. So the flowers there on the naked stems as the whole rest of the garden starts waking up. And the wonderful thing, the branches are high enough up, you can tuck all kinds of spring ephemerals, those things that come up in the spring, do their thing and then die back. You can tuck them up under the skirts of this plant so right up to the uh the base of the plant uh so you you're not wasting or losing that valuable space under the plant those things will come up bloom and die back before the foliage comes out so you don't want to put in a summer bloomer there because you'll never see it because once the foliage is out but for the spring ephemerals like the bulbs it's perfect all right, I can hear the groans on this one, even from a distance. And I, in the past, would have been one of those groaning on a Cuba. It's like, are you kidding, a Cuba? But, you know, I, I still despise this gold dust. Uh, it, it just looks like a Clorox nightmare on this. But there are so many good attributes about a Cuba. You've got dry, deep shade. This is your answer. Uh, pretty much the only way to kill a Cuba is over water or put it in a wet spot or also put it out in full sun. It'll fry the foliage. Uh, give it your nastiest place and it shines. Um, there are lots of good varieties. Rosani, which is shown here, is one of my favorites. It is very elegant, just glossy green foliage. And then the, the one thing about a Cuba, you have male plants and you have female plants. And you need both to form berries, usually. Rosani is self-sufficient. She doesn't need... She doesn't need a male. Uh-uh. She's fine on her own. And so you you're you will always get these bright red berries during the winter. So it looks very much like a holly leaf. 
So for those people that cannot grow holly, try Rosani. You, you'll feel, you'll fool a few people. Uh, and this Akuba Picturata, uh, another a selection of Akuba that I just love. I have this at home. Um, again, if it gets in too much sun, it's going to fry like an Irish baby on the beach. Um, borrowing a, a, a term from my friend Dan Benarsik. Uh, anyway, look at Akubas again. Give them a second look, and um, they're, they're good plants. Another, and this one's a, a Native American. Akuba is a Japanese plant, by the way. Um, so uh, Elysium floridanum, Native American. Uh, and the cultivar here is Haley's Comet. And for any of you that like to play around with star anise, uh, you, you now, oops, let me go back. Uh, well, anyway, uh, that's where, you know, look at the flower uh, and that's where the star anise comes from. It's a different member of the family. Uh, this is Elysium ver verum. Uh, it's not hardy here. Uh, and don't try eating the seeds of our Native American because they are not. Uh -uh. And it doesn't form those cool pods. But the flowers are just Sputnik worthy. Uh, really, really cool. Uh, clean green foliage throughout the year. This is what it looks like when it's not in bloom. Just a really pretty green mass, a green background for shade conditions. Um, it can handle moist conditions. It actually comes from wet areas in the wild. Um, but a really, really nice thing. Uh, and as I was putting this presentation together, I, I found uh, someone was claiming, it, I, I read this ID tip, and it said that the bruise foliage smells like a gin and tonic. Hmm. I need to go uh, ha have some more time with my Elysium. Uh, the uh, the plant itself, the foliage and the fruits are poisonous to livestock. So don't have your goats out or your cows around an Elysium. Uh, but uh, there's another new one on the market called uh, a selection with golden foliage. This is Elysium Floridanum Florida Sunrise Sunshine. Uh, beautiful, beautiful golden yellow foliage for the shade uh despises sun literally it just will curl up its toes and die uh but a, a really nice plant to add a little a little bling to a shady area all right another fabulous plant for the shade Danae Danae racemosa uh anyone that does flower arranging might recognize Danae uh from uh bouquets delivered to your door um danae makes a great filler plant for flower arranging uh it is a member well the botanists sometimes have it in the asparagus family and sometimes in lily family um but whatever the classification is it's a good durable plant uh, hardier than the the books have been saying, I've been growing it in DC and Northern Virginia for about 15 years. Absolutely no winter damage. Um, so try it, try it. It's hard to come by because it's so slow to produce. So if you find someone that has, has plants, these red berries, that uh, mature in the winter will drop to the ground and they will produce little uh, seedlings. You know, you can dig those up and start your own. Takes about seven years to get a saleable plant. Um, so that's why it's so expensive and hard to find in the trade, but it's a cool plant. And once you have it, it, it bulks up fairly quickly. If you want to, you can cut it to the ground every spring and then the new growth will come up like this. 
Uh, oops, sorry. Back. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm having trouble today. <laughs> There you go. Uh, you know, otherwise the plant can get uh, the each individual stem can get about five feet tall and then sort of flop over very fountain esque. Um, I find that by putting a peony cage over it as it's growing, that'll give it a little support so it doesn't absolutely flop and and cover a 10 foot radius uh, a little staking, you know, a little little support's good for all of us. So Danae racemosa. Uh, this plant does not like to be transplanted. So uh, plant it where you want it. And when, if you do need to transplant it, dig a deep hole uh, when you're trying to spade it out. So, but I, I've been successful in transplanting it. Uh, they often will sit for a year and sulk They'll sort of look at you squinty eyed, like, why didn't you do this to me? But uh, they recover and do fine. So, next plant, sarcococca. I mean, it's good to grow sarcococca just so you can say sarcococca. Sarcococca. Uh, uh, the <laughs> you, can, you can tell I'm sitting in a room alone talking to myself. So my my apologies, folks. Uh, but Circa Coke is an, a fabulous, just uh, un, it's a tough little workhorse. Uh, the the most commonly sold is Hookeriana humulus, uh, the little dwarf. It's only about a foot tall. Uh, it's known as sweet box. It does somewhat resemble a boxwood, a very low ground cover boxwood that with age, it sends out runners and forms a mass. Uh, it blooms in the spring and usually you don't see the flowers. I mean, on this one, the flowers look uh, very held up above the foliage. That's ours. ours you always need to dig in there a little deeper to see them. Your nose will find it before your eyes, or at least for me. Again, much like the Edgeworthia, it, the flowers are small, but powerful to attract the pollinators in because uh, of the time of year it blooms. It's, it's a wonderful little thing. Uh, you really don't have to do any maintenance to it at all. Occasionally, I'll go in and after a tough winter, if some of the stems look a little ratty and everything, uh, I'll selectively cut back those individual stems. And I've also learned through <laughs> that having plants trampled that the plant can be cut all the way to the ground and it will regenerate new growth. I don't really advise doing this um, all the time, or I would cut maybe half of it back at a time to give the plant still some some leaves to produce chlorophyll uh, to keep growing. But it is a tough, durable thing. So don't over overlook sarcococca. All right, moving on to the sun, sun loving perennials. Amsonia. Uh, Amsonia hubrechtii, known as blue star. Again, a Native American plant native to the Midwestern prairies. It's a lovely thing. Um, the whole plant family is known as blue star, and there are a lot more members of the family than just hubrechtii. But I really love hubrechtii just for the, the foliage. I. The flowers, eh, I get, eh, they're nothing to write home about. They really, uh, they're small, they're, they're bluish white, but look at the foliage, the foliage, look, touch, touch, touch me. I mean, it's like a feather boa just beckoning to be petted to be fondled, to be played with. Uh, it's, it's an awesome, awesome plant. Great texture, a great backdrop for so many things. 
up. It does want full sun. It can go into partial shade, but it won't be nearly as vigorous or stand upright. Uh, it can get a little floppy. Uh, it can get about four feet tall and four feet wide. If you'd like to keep it a little lower, what you can do is go back, go in after it blooms and cut it two thirds of the way down to the ground. So give it a, a chop back in there um, and that will prevent it from being so tall. I always forget to do that. That's a busy time of the year. Um, it does have a milky sap also. So wherever you make the cuts, it's going to leak and be sure not to have that, get that milky sap in your eyes. Uh, so use caution when cutting it back, uh, but it's a great plant. One other way to use it is plant them close together. Uh, it's a trick that Pete Odolf uses uh, when he's doing a mass planting and he wants a solid top to the Amsonia. He'll plant them very close together and they'll hold each other up. Most of us don't have the acreage and the space to to plant Amsonia in mass because each one can cover five feet um, square. Uh, but that's the way Pete does it. Ah, oh, lovely. There, there's one that has been cut back, obviously. And you see what I mean about uh, when they're tighter together, they'll hold each other up. But another reason to grow Amsonia is what it's doing right now. Uh, mine, mine out in the Ripley are not quite at this golden yellow yet, but within the next couple of weeks after they've had uh, lower temperatures at night, you'll get this golden yellow foliage that is just, ah, it's awesome. And it lasts, it, it's not like one and done that, that it lasts for like 24 hours and you gotta see it real quick. No, it lasts for weeks. Uh, just a great plant. Here it is. Uh, well, this planting no longer exists. This this was up at the Scott Arboretum, uh, a famous in the Crosby Courtyard. They had lined a walkway with Amsonia, and to walk through in the autumn was just wonderful. Uh, there's a there's a new building there is why this no longer exists. So, and then all the foliage does drop to the ground, leaving bare stems. Uh, you can leave those bare stems up for the winter. They're very fibery. You can, you can pull them apart and probably native, native peoples might've made rope or something out of them. I'm always amazed on how fibery they are. I chop mine up into smaller bits and pull them apart and leave them on the ground for the birds to use for nesting material. Uh, but that's the only maintenance I do. Next plant, uh, Thanksgiving is coming up. So salvia officinalis. Uh, uh, this is the cooking sage, full sun, uh, well-drained soil is all it asks for, uh, which is typical of plants with silvery gray foliage. Uh, Silvery gray, just a general rule will be that plant is more from a, a Mediterranean climate that wants well-drained soils, full sun, and um, not a whole lot of moisture. So Salvia bird garden. Bird garden has wider foliage than the straight Salvia officinalis, the cooking sage. Here it is with our friend Yucca Rostrata and this lovely mound of just silvery gray that just makes a perfect foil for other things. Um, Salvia Bird Garden doesn't bloom very often. It, you'll get a rando bloom on it, um, but really it's grown for the foliage. Um, looks pretty good throughout the winter. Uh, it's not perfectly evergreen, but you still have a presence there during the winter. And again, this is the, the salvia that you use for cooking. Uh, all right, I keep going the wrong direction. Uh, 
here's here's another of my favorites uh and in the background well the favorite i'm talking about here is euphorbia wolfinii uh euphorbia cariacus subspecies wolfinii wolfinii uh sage or spurge uh and behind it you see there's our friend the spirea ogon but in early spring when the bulbs are in, in bloom uh this euphorbia just takes center stage with those big massive chartreuse heads of of flowers the individual flower is actually way down in there it's a tiny little flower um with with a modified leaf or a bract around it to draw attention this is the same family as poinsettias so as you all know a poinsettia also the flower is tiny and those red leaves are modified bracts so anyway that's just your little botany lesson for the day but Euphorbia floral heads are just fantastic. I love the color chartreuse. It goes with everything. Uh, wonderful thing. Uh, and here it is. This is Wolfinii later in the summer. Blue gray glaucous foliage that just, again, it it's like the little black dress that matches everything and makes everything else look even better. So wonderful plant hard to find um but easily grown from seed so find a friend that has it uh in seed or you can get seed from and you can grow it that way or look at the better nurseries they'll they'll be carrying it here it is in the winter even snow capped it's it's i like it um mediterranean so full sun well-drained soil and it detests too much moisture so uh for those of us that live in virginia with heavy clay soils amend 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 uh but it it's a lovely plant the maintenance that i do once a year um let's go back to the flower heads uh you see all those big flower heads those are all seed on this plant and the thing with euphorbia euphorbia ac the whole family when the seed is ripe, it explodes. Literally, it explodes and poof, sends its seed everywhere. Uh, so to prevent having a whole garden of euphorbias, you go in and let's use this stem as an example. This flower head here and that stem goes all the way down. You cut that entire stem down to the base of the plant and maybe if you want seeds, uh, put like a uh, one of those uh, mesh bags over it. Find find mesh bags so that airflow gets in, but you can control where the seeds go. I will cut off uh, almost every single one of these flower heads to the base, and then new growth will start at the base. If you don't cut off the flower heads. The new growth will start way out here and pretty soon you've just got this leggy mess. So give it a hack back once a year. Again, it's got uh, milky sap in the stems. So don't touch your eyes. Don't you know wash well when dealing with this plant. Um, but it's worth it. It's worth it. It's a love. It's a love. All right. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but we're moving on to the shade. And uh, I absolutely love ornamental grasses. And I, I think grasses, when you add to any garden, they add movement and texture and, and just a, an interest that you don't get in any other plant family. So, add grasses whenever possible. And so a few of my favorites for shade include this Hakanakloa. And it, it's fun to be able to say to Hakanakloa. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> I could go on, but I won't. Uh, I'll spare you. This is Hakanakloa macro aureola. It's known as the Japanese Hakoni grass. Um, 
and uh, they use it in Japan, I've, I've read and been told, often to emulate water because of the flowy nature of the grass. Uh, my favorite is this golden form. Uh, well, it's, it's green and yellow, both. Uh, it's very vigorous. Once it gets going, it takes a little bit to get it established. Uh, but once it's established, it multiplies and gets wider with time. It, it's only about maybe 14 inches tall, but because it droops over the graceful arch, it'll cover about 24 to 30 inches square um, diameter on the ground. Just a beautiful plant. Um, there is also the solid green form, Hakanakloa macra. Uh, and then there's also one that is all gold. Uh, it's just the golden leaf. Uh, the all gold I have found to be not as vigorous um, and really needs moisture, um, consistently moist, moist soils. Uh, in the Ripley Garden, I garden under American Elms. Moist shade is non-existent. Uh, root infested dry shade, absolutely. Um, but Hakanakloa macro uh, all gold has not been as uh, vigorous for me as some of the others. But look around, there are other selections also. But here it is mixed in the garden. Uh, this is under an American elm. I do have irrigation, but still it's dry shade. Um, and once it's established, it, it meanders quite nicely. Uh, just gets wider with time, it does not send out shoots uh, to the other side of a planting bed. Very nice thing. Uh, you can easily dig it up, uh, chunk it up with a spade and spread it that way once established. Uh, throughout the fall, it, it takes on these tawny tones and just really beautiful, the orange tones. And look at it, it's bright and glistening. And then I leave it up for the winter uh, again, to add texture and interest. And then in early spring, I'll cut it back to the ground before I notice new growth to allow tulips to come up through it. This is Tulip Cynthia. It's a uh, Tulip Chrysantha. Uh, lovely little spreading perennial tulip. Uh, and I love how the Hakanakloa just acts as a perfect foil to cover up those uh, kind of uh, leggy stems. So that was, that was uh, Hakanakloa. Oh, nice spelling error. <laughs> uh, this is, oops, uh, that was supposed to be Carex oceamensis everillo. Uh, so the Hakanakloa spreads by runners to form masses this way and new shoots come up. Carex Oshimensis everillo is a clump former that just the clump itself gets bigger from the mass out and forms this graceful mound or hummock, I would say, of golden, golden yellow foliage. Uh, it's a lovely thing. It's a Japanese native uh, with selections coming from Ireland. There's a whole series. There's Everest, Everillo, uh, Evershine, Ever... Nah. They, they're all out there and they're all fabulous. Um, Everillo so far is my favorite uh, because of that golden color in a dark area. Uh, they seem to grow better with um, moderate moisture but they handle dry shade quite well once established. So give them, give them the best home possible to start them out uh, and you'll be happy with them. Uh, and here, here it is, you know, you don't have to put these plants in the ground. They're wonderful in pots too. And this one is fairly new on the market called Carex Feather Falls. And What's different about Feather Falls, and there's one called Ribbon Falls also, is each of the 
the leaves will go down about two feet. So it's a really elegant, graceful plant that hangs low. I haven't noticed the long um, foliage texture as much in the ground as I have upright in a pot. I had a pot of feather falls outside, I guess it's been two years now, uh, all winter in a container looking fabulous and little to no winter burn. Um, the burn that I did get was because it had dried out um, and that was gardener's fault. So any Carrick's Feather Falls, and if you want a solid green, it's Ribbon Falls. Uh, and Carrick's do bloom, by the way. Here's, here's the bloom of a Carrick's. Uh, little, little spikes, little, cute little interest, nothing to write home about, but they, they add just another little, little bit of texture and interest throughout the year. So, I pulled back the curtain a little bit to show you that, you know, I, I rely on certain plants to, to make the garden shine throughout the year. So maybe next time when you come and visit, you'll notice, wow, look, there's that spirea she talked about. And there's, there's, there's some carrots. And there's our good friend, the yucca. Uh, and let's see what else we've got. You know, oh, here, a uh, closer close up of that same picture. Here's the spirea ogon. There's the carrots everillo. Uh, and there's the yucca color guard. Uh, and, you know, these things are holding the stage all together. In a few weeks, there's a tree peony right there that will take center stage and just shine on. But when the divas aren't on stage, the rest of these plants hold the garden together and, and give it interest. So come on down, uh, well, mask up when you can, and I hope to see you in the garden. And until then, be well and go play in the dirt. All the best. Janet, thank you. That was terrific. Uh, My soul feels better seeing all these beautiful, colorful plants when I'm sitting inside when it's raining and it's going it to be cold. It is pretty gloomy. Up. Yeah, it's it pretty is gloomy. pretty gloomy out yeah, there today. Yeah, it's great. Well, I, most of you captured their attention so much there weren't that many questions, and oh. I was able to answer a lot of them. But I don't know what that red. Somebody asked what the red marigold was by the oh. euphorbia, and I have no idea. I. <laughs> uh, you want the <laughs> honest answer? I um, procured a few seeds from a public garden a few years ago, like 15 years ago, um, and I do not know the cultivar. But we don't want that happening at Smithsonian Gardens. We always tell people we're federal property, so we don't we don't come and and. and <laughs> no, don't take. But, but Janet will tell you where you where she found them. Yeah, so that and, would be a good thing. And if people just ask the gardener, uh, if we have extra uh, gardeners worldwide are very generous people, uh, but we don't like it when people just help no. themselves. No, I agree. We don't want to do that. Um, I don't know, there were a couple other ones. I, one of the questions that I know in my experience, uh, the salvia burgotten does not do well in pots to overwinter. I've always had it and it's because it freezes and thaws too many times. But if you were further south, uh, I think that'd be fine. Have you had success with it in a container? Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I think Rick had it in in an urn over in front of the freer in a container and it did just fine. Okay. I, I think one of the challenges is we forget to water our containers during the winter. And I, it, that could be more stressful to the plant than uh, so much freeze and thaw because, well, as long as the container is big enough. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. go a big container um, and less likely the freeze and thaw is going to uh, freeze it like an ice cube. Um, but remember 
to check moisture level in the soil for the winter. And he would have had a double layer too, which really would have helped so that you would have had the urn and then a container. He just did it. Most of our containers are pretty thick. So I, I will yeah. stick with that. I, I, yeah. I'm going to say sage is pretty picky. Uh, and sage like lavender and many of the other sub shrubs, somebody asked when you prune them. And my advice was to prune um, when you start to see the new growth in the spring. Would you agree? Absolutely. Uh, people get really anxious in the spring uh, with things like artemisia, uh, the salvias, perovskia, mm -hmm. all of those things. You want to tidy them up because they're looking pretty rough in the spring, but you've got to wait until new growth starts. Um, otherwise, just compost it now. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, so that's that's the nice thing to know that know your plant before you start pruning. And that was mm -hmm. one of our lessons we learned last week with Jake, our, our arborist. Know your plant, know what the habit is, and learn when to prune it so you don't kill it. So what is the interesting hellebore, the green hellebore, that was with the ribbon falls? Do you remember that? Or is it in the potus forget us? Out of the potus forget us. <laughs> to this. Yeah. Oh, that, that one right there is Maybe. Hellebores fetidus. Um, yeah, there's, yeah, there, there's no other. It's okay. got to be that one. Hellebores fetidus, the stinking hellebore. The stink. Oh, one of my favorites. That, that's got a, such a horrible common name. Let's call it bear's foot hellebore. It's mm -hmm. fabulous. And I love the chartreuse seed heads. Uh, it, it will self-sow and form a colony because each one of these, those are maturing seeds right there. And if you let all the seeds mature, you will have a lot of hellebores. Uh, but again, you can just selectively cut off some of those heads and leave a few to self-sow in the garden. It's, it's a wonderful plant. Mm -hmm. It is a wonderful plant. It's one of my favorites. Well, let's go back and revisit the Amsonia because that ah. is probably my favorite perennial. I'm so glad you so, highlighted sorry. it. Sorry, I don't yeah. want to make you sick going back through these. That's all right. I yeah. close my eyes. But uh, how do you divide the Amsonia? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> glad to meet you. All right. Uh, dividing an Amsonia. Hmm. Um, you find a very young, very strong uh, teenage boy that- um, Or girl, strong girl. Well, uh, I mean, I, well, yeah. Well, okay, I don't want to be sexual there, but uh, it's a beast to divide. It really is. It forms almost like a tree trunk at the base with multiple heads. Um, you will need a very, very sharp ax and- um, Courage. Cur well, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, get ready for a, a workout. Uh, mm -hmm. It puts roots down. It is a Midwestern prairie plant. So you've seen those videos of how deep the roots go down and this is one of them. And uh, good luck. <laughs> yeah. I dug one of mine up one time and I put it in the trunk of my car and forgot about it. Two oh. weeks later, in the middle of the summer, it was still fine oh, yeah. and I planted it and it survived. So yeah. it yeah. is a tough plant. Yeah, um, I don't know about yours, but I get lots of little babies, uh, lots of little seedlings underneath mine. So maybe you don't have to divide it. Maybe just find somebody with little babies yeah. and they can share them with you. Yeah, uh, That would be really good. So yeah. what is the best time to divide this Amsonia? Uh, when do you have helper? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I guess I would do it a uh, fall or winter uh, mm -hmm. because it is really hardy. It well, depending on your hardiness zone. Uh, in the DC metro area, it's it's bone hardy for us without a problem. Um, Amsonia. I'm trying to off the top of my head. I don't know. No. I don't think I put a, a, a Midwest hardiness zone or a USDA a hardiness zone. I think it's a hardy to zone three. So if you're near the colder points of the hardiness or, or 
uh, it's marginal in your area, wait until spring. If mm -hmm. it is uh, bone hardy, you could do it in the fall. Uh, but again, be prepared for a workout. Mm -hmm. Be prepared. I agree. Same thing if you've got a Baptisia. Be prepared. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Another one of my favorites. Um, I just, so of all these plants in here, there weren't very many natives that you highlighted, but I know oh. you're using natives in the garden. So uh, there, there's some, there's some, uh -huh. uh, Amsonia, definitely. Uh, but the question is, what are some of the natives that you include in the Ripley garden that you would highlight perhaps in another presentation? And uh, you could give us a sneak peek uh, just by talking okay. about it, not, not okay. showing a picture, of course. Okay, yeah. Well, of, of what I talked about today, uh, the whole yucca family, the physocarpus, the uh, elysium, the amsonia. Uh, yeah, okay. Those are all U.S. natives. Mm -hmm. um, the panicum family, looking into grasses. Panicums are just gorgeous. Um, there are some from low foot and a half to two feet, uh, all the way up to Sky Racer, which will be eight to nine feet tall. Mm -hmm. Full sun, well-drained soil. Uh, another grass, the andropogons uh, mm -hmm. or shizacriums, uh, the blue stems, the little blue stem and big blue stem. Um, right now, I am absolutely enamored with the big blue stem uh, uh, black hawks. Oh yeah, which the bur the f the foliage turns a lovely burgundy as the temperature drops. Just wonderful and a very vertical. Uh, Pycnanthemums uh, for a perennial. Uh, Pycnanthemum muticum is is a love. However, it needs to be contained. It spreads by runners, very much like a monarda. Um, and if, if you're not containing it, you will have a garden only of pycnanthemum. Uh, but I love pycnanthemum for the fragrance when you brush up against it, mm -hmm. the number of insects it draws in. It, it's tough, durable plant for a uh, hot, dry location. Mm -hmm. But just be aware of those runners mm -hmm. and um, it'll, it'll fill in very very nicely yes yeah i agree and if you want to see more native plants just walk through the pollinator garden because mm -hmm. that garden has so many native plants and they're still shining and looking beautiful yeah uh, in our gardens as well so there are so many wonderful plants out there i know you spent your lifetime gathering uh, using observing loving falling out of love with all these different plants uh, so i want to ask you what your favorite is yeah. But I thank you so much for all these wonderful suggestions, and I'm sure you'll be back with share, to share more with us. Uh, but we are looking forward to having people come down to visit us, and we hope that you do. Just as Janet said, please wear your mask and remember mm -hmm. to social distance, and please don't sneak up on Janet uh, while <laughs> she's working. Uh, she'll be glad to talk and answer questions, but don't sneak up on her, especially at this time uh, in our lives. Uh, that's the type of challenge we don't want to uh, be able to address. Uh, so the gardens are lovely. We really do yeah. enjoy. Last words of party parting wisdom for us, Janet, if you may. Oh, just get out and play in the, in the dirt. It's I knew good. you were going to say that. <laughs> it, it's so good for your soul. It, um, there are a lot of woes in the world right now and a lot of worry. Um, and connecting to the earth will, will really help. And so all the gardeners, get out there and keep beautifying the world. Agreed. We'll get through this together. Agreed. And next week... If you'd like to join us again, we'd love to have you. Aaron Clark is going to be talking to us about weeds. And what are weeds? Uh, weeds, I learned, are just a misplaced plant. So often the things that we think are weeds are just the things that we're tired of seeing. So join us again next week. And we hope to see how our gardens have improved your thumb. And now your thumb will be as green as Janet's and Aaron's. See you in the garden. Bye-bye. Take care, all.